If you're able, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you can be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. It is, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning, looking at God's word here in Romans chapter one. If we haven't met yet, my name's Josh. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Sojourn. And uh, last week, we started a new sermon series going through the book of Romans. Uh, and I'm, man, I'm really excited about that. And I, I said all kinds of things about how important Romans was last week. And so if you missed that, you can go to our app uh, and find that particular sermon. And, and listen, I'm not going to say them all again, but it's really important. Maybe the most important theological work ever. Uh, and so there, there's a lot that God is going to say to us as we walk through Romans over the next many months. Uh, this morning, we're continuing here in the introduction portion of the letter. Uh, most people, when they, when they kind of uh, outline Romans out, the introduction is kind of the first 17 verses. And so we're, we're taking three weeks. We're going to move at a little faster pace eventually. But we're taking three weeks right here at the beginning uh, we want to make sure we, we understand it. So next week, actually Tanner is going to be preaching here for the first time. There it is. And he's got 16 and 17, which, uh, you know, those are just kind of important verses. So I, you know, that's for you. Uh, but today, we're just 8 through 15. Uh, I mentioned last week uh, in, this, in this first paragraph in verses 1 to 7, it was, it was kind of a salutation, a bit, a bit of an introduction of kind of who Paul was. And, and now here in 8 through 15, uh, as Paul's continuing this introduction, uh, he, he's going to reveal a little bit more about his reason for writing uh, and what it is that he is, is hoping to accomplish. Uh, and, and, you know, when you read all these different commentaries and books, there, there's a lot out there in the world that's been written about Romans, more, about, more than about any other book in the Bible. Uh, and when you read it all, uh, different people, th th there's been a long going debate about why Paul wrote Romans. Uh, and so what I found is that most of the people that I read listed like seven different reasons that he wrote Romans. Uh, and, you know, part of it is like theological treatise. Part, is it, part of it is he's raising money. He wants to go to Spain. You're going to find that out later in the letter. He's trying to raise money for missionary endeavors. He's, anyway, there, there's all these different reasons. But I, I think at its most basic level, the reason he writes to the, to the Roman Christians is because he hasn't yet been to Rome. Uh, and that, that becomes clear here in our passage today. And, and I think right at the heart uh, of what uh, Paul is writing here and what I think God wants to say to us today is, is this idea that in our lives, we all have desires. We all have things that we want to do, plans that we hope that we will accomplish. Uh, if you're a Christian this morning, hopefully uh, those desires are informed by God and they're informed by his word and your plans, you're trying more and more to align them with God's plan for your life. Uh, but, but regardless of whether or not you're a Christian this morning, all of us have plans, all of us have dreams, all of us have desires. Uh, and the reality of, of life is that sometimes, and, and maybe even for many of us, oftentimes, our dreams don't come true. Our desires do not come to pass the way that we want them to. Uh, yesterday was kind of the official kickoff of the college football season, uh, which meant that I had an amazing day yesterday, watching 
Uh, probably yesterday, more football than I'll get to watch for the rest of the year. That's okay. Praise be to God. It was a wonderful day. And, uh, and I, if you don't know, I went to the University of Oklahoma. I'm a Sooner. Uh, the Sooners kicked it off on Friday night, 51-3, to in case you're wondering. No issues. Uh, we won. Uh, but yesterday was a reminder that, you know, for all of the off-season hopes and dreams and training and working, uh, a lot of teams, about half the teams, right, the dreams were dashed, okay? Uh, if you're an Aggie in the room this morning, I'm sorry, the dreams were dashed last night. And the good thing, and I, I told my wife this, the good thing is that Aggies know how to handle that kind of, that kind of disappointment. <laughs> That's not a new feeling, something they're used to. Uh, and if, if you're going to the new to Sojourn Social and you're like, man, that was tough, that's okay. That's, that's just part of life. Um, that said, we all know what it is to be disappointed. We all know what it is to have uh, these plans that we want to see accomplished, and yet they don't exactly happen. And the interesting thing about Paul is that he has, he has a wonderful desire, right? He wants to go to Rome, uh, and he wants to be there, and he wants to be with the Christians there and to minister to the church there the way he's been able to go all around the, the rest of the Roman Empire and do that. And, and so, Paul, this is a great desire. This isn't a bad desire. It's not a sinful desire. It's not a wrong desire. And yet it's unfulfilled. Uh, and so I think there, there's some tension here, and we're going to see how Paul addresses that. But I, I think kind of hanging over everything uh, that I'm going to say this morning, I, I think all of us uh, can just kind of think about and wrestle with that tension of these plans and these desires that we have, and yet often they're unfulfilled. Well, as we go through uh, these seven verses, 8 to 15 this morning, uh, as I mentioned at the top, we're going to learn a little bit more about Paul, and we're going to learn a little bit more about why he's writing and what it is that he's hoping to accomplish in this letter. And so as we go through, I want to point out three things uh, that I think we're going to see. First of all, we're going to see Paul's desire. Second of all, we're going to see Paul's failure. And finally, we're going to see Paul's commitment. So Paul's desire, Paul's failure, and Paul's commitment. First of all, Paul's desire. Why is it that Paul is writing this letter? Why is it that he uh, is reaching out? Uh, We see it right here in first verse 8. As you you think about kind of this basic question of, well, why does Paul want to go to Rome? Why is it that he wants to see the Roman church? There's a few reasons that I think... Uh, that reveal his desire for them, for the church, uh, and to go there. So starting in verse 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So the first thing uh, that Paul mentions about the church in Rome is, is their faith. He says, your faith is proclaimed throughout all the world. In, in other words, they have uh, a high level of faith. They have an impressive amount of faith. Uh, if, if We went through the book of Acts not too long ago here at Sojourn. So if you were here for that, uh, you heard me mention this uh, several times. But if you're not familiar with Paul or you're not familiar with the New Testament, uh, Paul has a very uh, familiar strategy that he goes about in, in going out to these different cities and taking the gospel out. Paul's strategy uh, is that he goes to a, a, a city, typically one that has not yet heard the gospel, and he starts by going to the synagogue, and he, he preaches to the Jews, and then he starts to preach to the Gentiles, the, the, uh, the Roman citizens, uh, and he uh, has people who come to faith in Christ, and then he starts a church there, and then he's there for a while, typically uh, anywhere from 18 months. The longest place was about three years that he stayed. So he stays there for a while, uh, enough time to, to kind of get the church going. He raises up other pastors and elders and leaders there, and then he goes on. He leaves and he goes to another place. And when you look at the cities that Paul went to, they're all really important cities. They were, they were large cities. They were cultural centers. They were centers of commerce. Uh, they, were, they were some of the biggest cities in the empire, okay? Uh, and so it doesn't, it doesn't take much to figure out this is kind of the way that Paul wanted to do things. If that was Paul's strategy, it makes sense that he wanted to go to Rome, because Rome is the capital city. Rome is the largest city. It's the place where the emperor was. It's the place of power. It's the place of influence above any other, any other city in the world at that time. And so it makes sense that Paul had this desire to say, I want to get to Rome. And even though 
Even though the gospel had already been proclaimed there, even though there, there was already a church that had been started there, Paul still wanted to get there and see these people. And the first reason he says is because your faith, your faith is known throughout the whole world. Notice something important here, that Paul says that he thanks God for their faith. Isn't that interesting? Notice he doesn't say, I thank you for your faith. He says, I thank God for your faith. Uh, This reminds us of something that that Paul hits on throughout his letters in the New Testament, that, that faith is the gift of God. It's not something that we produce on our own. Uh, And yet, even though faith is a gift, and and Paul rightly recognizes that God is the one who is ultimately responsible for the faith of these Roman Christians, uh, we realize that God works faith out through people, right? Faith is not merely in kind of this abstract intellectual concept, but it's worked out in the lives of people. And so he says, I thank God for you. I thank God for the way your faith that he has graciously given to you is proclaimed all over the world. In other words, Paul says, everywhere I go, on all of my travels, all of my missionary journeys, as we call them, all these cities that I go to, I hear about your faith, Uh, which is pretty remarkable considering, again, this is the power center. This is the place uh, where the church uh, was certainly meeting some resistance. Persecution hadn't yet broken out the way it's going to when Paul's writing this. Uh, There, I mentioned before about 57 AD, so this is right before Nero's persecution breaks out, if you're familiar uh, with that. So so persecution hasn't quite yet broken out, and yet the church certainly would have been meeting adversity there in Rome, and yet their faith is what's standing out. So that's that's the first thing we see about Paul's desire to see them. He wants wants to see them for their faith. The the next thing that stands out about Paul is is his prayer life. Verse 9 says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with, my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Uh, So there it is, there it is clearly that Paul wants to come. And he says, I'm praying all the time that God will let me come to you. Uh, In fact, Paul says that he is doing it uh, without ceasing, right? Praying that God would let me come and see you. And so, here we have just a little window into who Paul is. And what we see is that Paul's a man of prayer. Paul is a man who is constantly, unceasingly, throughout the day, in a constant conversation with the Lord. Uh, And Paul had a lot of things to be bringing to the Lord. Uh, But what he had was a lot of churches to be bringing to the Lord and a lot of Christians to be bringing to the Lord and and a lot of spiritual needs to bring to the Lord. And and I think for us, as as we think about, again, just Paul's example here, you know, uh, when we pray, when we come to the Lord, uh, and I, I say we, let me just talk about me. When I come to the Lord, so often I come to the Lord with like physical material needs. Okay, that's that's like the number one thing probably I pray for. If, um, if, I'm, if I'm just kind of praying and not, if I don't have like my prayer journal out and I'm, I'm kind of thinking about it really. Uh, and on the one hand, that's okay. God tells us that we should, we should cast our cares on him, okay? That we should bring our material, physical needs to him. So there's nothing wrong with those prayers. But when you think about Paul, I mean, th- this introduction to Romans is very similar to all the other introductions that he writes in his letters. And he always talks about praying for these people, and he's, he's, you know, I'm sure there were some material needs in there, but he's praying for their spiritual needs. He's praying that they would grow in their faith, that they would be bold for the gospel, that God would bring more people into his kingdom. And, and I just, I, if you're like me, as I thought about this, I thought, man, I'm, I'm probably not praying for spiritual things enough, right? I'm, I'm probably not in my prayer life praying for spiritual things the way that Paul. 
room to grow. For some of us, we might latch onto that idea of, of Paul saying, praying unceasingly. Kind of this constant conversation that's going on all day long with prayer. You know, for some of us, our prayer lives are, are they're, they're kind of like, it's kind of like an appointment situation. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, meal times, maybe bedtime if we have kids or maybe with our spouse. And, and, and that's kind of it. It's like appointment viewing. Uh, and it's, it's not a constant conversation that's going on throughout the day. So that might be another place to grow in your prayer life to say, hey, what, what, you know, it's great that I have these particular times picked out, but, but could there be more of a conversation that's happening throughout the day? So we get a little window into Paul's prayer life. And then the, the last thing that we see as we think about Paul's desire to see this church is that he wants to encourage them, right? Ultimately, the reason he wants to go is to encourage them. So look at verse 11. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So there, there's, a, there's a few things to unpack here in these two verses. Uh, as Paul says, hey, I, I want to come see you in order to encourage you. Uh, and he has a, a particular kind of encouragement in mind. He says that there in verse 11, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Okay? Uh, Paul does not tell us exactly what the spiritual gift is that he wants to impart, uh, we, so we don't, we don't know. Uh, and I, I would say we ought not speculate about what it is, per, this particular gift that Paul wanted to give, but he, he had a gift in mind that he wanted to give, maybe even more than one, uh, that would be of encouragement. Uh, I'm sure it was something that pertained to their particular situation, uh, but more generally, I think we can just be reminded that all the spiritual gifts are gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why we call them spiritual gifts. They're gifts of the Spirit that are given to Christians in order for the church to be encouraged. And we read 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, which is kind of the primary passage about gifts in the New Testament. Uh, it's clear. Paul's explicit there. Hey, the reason you have gifts is to encourage one another and build one another up. And so here in, in Paul just, just merely writing out, his desire, what he's hoping to see happen if he can make it to Rome. He says, I want to impart to you a spiritual gift. Uh, it just reminds us that in our church, in the local church, that is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be using our spiritual gifts to encourage one another, to do exactly what Paul wanted to do with the church in Rome. And then notice in verse 12, he says that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And, and, you know, Paul, when you, when you read Paul, I mean, his humility comes out all the time, for, which is, I, I think that's one of the most amazing things about Paul, because I, I think of Paul very much like capital A Apostle Paul, right? Uh, but he's a guy who's filled with humility, and here he is saying, hey, yes, I want to encourage you, but I want you to encourage me. And, and in that, he's saying, I, one, I need to be encouraged, right? I'm not above being encouraged. I need to be encouraged, and that I expect that you will encourage me just as I want to encourage you. In other words, Paul's not coming to them saying, well, you know, I'm Mr. Super Apostle, so you guys, I, you've got a lot to hear from me. That's not Paul's attitude at all. He says, well, yes, I have some things that I want to bring to you, but I know you're, I'm going to receive just as much as I am going to give. And I think what we really see here in verses 11 and 12, again, is this picture of what God wants his church to be like, that uh, we would be imparting spiritual gifts with one another, that we would be mutually encouraging one another and encouraged by each other's faith. Uh, I, that's, what, that's what the church ought to be. It ought to be a place where we are encouraged by one another, by the presence of one another, uh, by hearing about what God is doing in one another's lives. Uh, we have this really beautiful picture. So uh, that is Paul's desire. He wants to come he wants to see what's happening there in order, in order that he can encourage them. So that's Paul's desire. The next thing that we're going to talk about here is Paul's failure. Paul's failure. Now, when we talk about Paul, we don't often talk about his failure. <laughs> there weren't a lot, uh, at least that we know of in the scriptures, not, not after he came to faith. Um, but here in verse 13, we do see a, a really clear failure. On Paul's part, verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. 
Let me pause there. So Paul has desired, we've seen this already, he's desired. And in fact, he's even attempted to come to Rome. Uh, the way he talks about it, I think probably more than one occasion that he has intended, he's made a plan to get to Rome, and yet it hadn't happened yet. Those plans, for whatever reason, have been thwarted, and he has not been able to come and see them. Uh, a couple of things, I think, to reflect on as, as we consider Paul saying this. One is that, notice how he begins verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware. In other words, I want you guys to know that I really have tried to come and see you, okay? And, and I think what, what Paul has in mind uh, is something that I think all of us can relate to. Uh, that as he's writing this letter to them and saying, oh man, I care about you guys so much. I pray for you all the time. I'm thinking about you all the time. Your faith is not all over the world. Uh, that they might not fully believe that it's true because he hasn't been to see him yet. When you get you guys tracking with that? That that it's possible that, you know, the church in Rome, they know who Paul is. I mean, you think their faith is not all over the world, like Paul's faith is not all over the world. People knew who Paul was. And he's been all over the Roman Empire. Okay? And this is at this point, he's already this is at the end of his third journey. So he's been on th- It's possible that some of them are maybe even offended. It's possible that some of them would be like, I don't know if I really believe you. I don't know that I really believe that you want to come and see us. I don't really know if it's true that you really want to pray for us when you haven't made it here yet. You've made it everywhere else, but you haven't yet made it here. I don't know if you've ever been in a spot like that where someone is telling you that they want something that they're desiring something. Maybe it's time with you, like it is in this case, but they just keep canceling plans or they just keep not making it or they keep ghosting you and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, I really want to do that. Like how, do you, eventually you stop believing, right? Eventually you're like, ah, you know, if you really wanted to, then you would just do it, okay? One of the things uh, that my wife lovingly reminds me of is that if I really wanted to do it, I would make time for it. Uh, and she's right, that the things that I really want to do, I make time for. That's kind of the way we work as people. And so I think it's very natural to imagine these Roman Christians thinking, you know, Paul, if you really wanted to be here, I think you just would have come. I think you just would have made time. And so I think Paul anticipates that response. And, and that's why he says, I don't want you to be anywhere. I want you to know that I've tried to come to you. Many times I've planned it. And it just hasn't worked out. He wants them to know that his lack of coming does not mean a lack of desire. It's not a lack of love or care or want to. So what is it that has prevented Paul from coming? Well, I think it's pretty clear. It's implicit, but it's pretty clear. Paul is saying, God has prevented me from coming to see you. God has not allowed this to happen yet. Uh, How do we know that? Go back to verse 9. Notice he says this, for God is my witness that I pray for you all the time. Okay? In other words, Paul literally says, if you don't believe me, ask God. God is the one who will vouch for me that what I'm saying is true. Uh, That phrase, for God is my witness there in English, it's it's a form of an oath uh, that, that people would take. We imagine Christians might have taken that in the first century. Uh, And so Paul is saying, hey, essentially he's saying, uh, I promise you, you you can trust me. It's true that I really am praying for you. And then in verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware that I've often attended to come to you. Then he includes that little parenthesis, but thus far have been prevented. Well, who's the one who's preventing? It's not Paul who's preventing. It's the Lord who's preventing. And, and of course, the way that God has prevented has been a number of different ways. You know, there's been times where Paul's been arrested. You know, when you get arrested and you get thrown in jail, your plans change, okay? I, fortunately, I have not experienced that firsthand. I've been told that's kind of what happens, though, okay? So if you're in jail, your plans change. Uh, if you get stoned nearly to death, your plans change. 
If you, if you get beaten with, you guys know the, the cat of nine tiles, the 39 lashes, Paul received that five different times. That might change your, your plans. We know that from Paul's travels, he experienced shipwreck, he experienced sickness, he experienced desertion, he experienced all kinds of things. And so we can, we, we can think, yeah, okay, I understand. Like Paul made these, made these plans. It didn't always work. If you, if you looked at where, if you look on the map at where Paul's setting out from to get to Rome was a little further along. Uh, it was a little further to the west than he had made it thus far. It wasn't like he was like going to all the cities around Rome there in Italy and being like, ha ha, you guys, when am I going to get there? That wasn't it at all. Uh, Paul uh, had, had, again, desired to get there, but these different circumstances kept coming up. And again, ultimately, and particularly we understand Paul's theology, he understands that God's the one who's sovereign over that. And so, even though he has this desire to get to Rome, God has not yet allowed it to happen. Uh, and, and I think, and this is, I don't want to read too much in, and I think Paul's going to address this a little more later, so I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to say too much here, but, but I'll just say this. You know, it's clear that in our lives, sometimes we have really good godly desires that are from the Lord, and that we think they align perfectly with his will, and God just does not open those doors. And, 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 and we don't understand why. In this life, we do not know why. I mean, Paul's sitting here and saying, I don't, I don't know why I haven't been able to get to Rome yet. I mean, he can look back on what's actually happened and seen the fruit of his ministry and say, well, you know, I can kind of fill in some of the blanks. But ultimately, Paul doesn't know. He doesn't know. God hasn't told him, this is why I've kept you from coming to Rome explicitly. But he just knows it's happened. And Paul's response is to continue to trust in the Lord and to continue to follow where the Lord is leading uh, and I think, again, that's, that's such a wonderful example for us that when, when we have good and godly desires in our lives, and we're like, this, I want to walk through this door. It makes so much sense. And the Lord keeps closing it. Uh, rather than being frustrated or being angry at God, we, we can follow Paul's example here of saying, well, the Lord, he has something else. I don't know what it is. I can't understand it. I can't see it. But he has something else. So that's Paul's failure that he fails to come, uh, even though the failure is not due to anything in himself. It's not like Paul himself has been failing, uh, but instead, instead, and he's been doing something else. And we see that in that last part of verse 13, where he says, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. In other words, Paul says, I want to come so that I can do in Rome what I've been doing everywhere else. Just hasn't happened yet. So we've seen Paul's desire. We've seen Paul's failure. Paul desires to get to Rome. He's failed to actually get there. I want to close this morning with the last, the last thing to see in verses 14 and 15, and what, what I'm calling Paul's commitment, that even though Paul has, he has this desire to get to Rome, he hasn't yet made it, that has not uh, changed his resolve at all. Verse 14, he says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So uh, if, if we just kind of follow Paul's train of thought here, okay, introduction, and he's writing, he's saying, I want you to know that I pray for you all the time. I want you to know I hear about your faith. mission as a call from God. And so here we get, and now at the end of this introduction, a little bit of a bookend to that call that he has in mind. It says, I am under obligation. Well, who's the obligation from? Well, it's from the Lord. It said, I am obligated by the call of Jesus to, and he gives a couple of different groups of people, to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with 
with world history there in that first part of the world, you, you understand that barbarians were those who were kind of outside of the Roman Empire, uh, those who had not really experienced Greek culture or Roman culture at that time. Uh, and so they're all kind of referred to as, as barbarians. Uh, and then the Greeks here would be those that had been influenced by Greek culture and Roman culture. Uh, and, and that second part, both to the wise and the foolish, essentially the educated and the uneducated. And the point that Paul is saying here is, I'm under obligation to preach the gospel to everyone, to everyone. Those who are a part of the Roman Empire and those who are outside of the Roman Empire. Those who are educated, those who are uneducated. And, and we can keep going down from there. Those who are wealthy and in the upper class and those who are poor and in the lower classes. Those who are involved in the politics of the day and those who are not involved in the politics of the day. Again, we, you could just keep going. And, and he gives those two as kind of an all-encompassing everyone, everyone. And, and it's interesting here that normally whenever Paul says everyone, we're used to him saying Jews and Gentiles, okay, because he's typically writing there. But notice here as he's writing to a primarily Gentile audience that he says Greeks and barbarians, those in the Roman Empire and those outside of the Roman Empire and again, from Paul's perspective, this is just another way of saying everyone. I'm under an obligation to preach the gospel to everyone. And so, in other words, Paul's perspective is, wherever God sends me, I preach the gospel. I make plans of where I think God wants me to go. God has other things that send me in a different place. That's fine. Wherever I go, I preach the gospel. Wherever I go, again, back to that plan that I mentioned at the beginning. I set up a church, I raise up elders, and then I go and do it again in the next place. Verse 15, he wraps it up. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And a couple of things that I want to say about that. One thing uh, is that I think in some way, the fact that Paul has not yet been able to make it to Rome is why we get this letter and, and why it is quite a bit longer than almost every other letter Paul writes, except for 1 Corinthians, and why it is certainly much more kind of uh, theologically uh, robust when it comes to the gospel and unpacking the implications of the gospel. I think it's because Paul has not yet been able to get to Rome to say it to them. And so I think it's pretty clear that the, this is the stuff that Paul's been saying to all the other churches. He's just been able to say it in person. And thanks be to God that he hadn't yet been to Rome so that we can benefit from this. I mentioned before, you know, all the other letters that Paul writes, they're, they're, they're correspondence with churches he set up or, or to Timothy or to Titus, guys that he's discipled and mentored who are now pastoring. And, and he's addressing all these specific issues that are coming up in those contexts. That's not what Romans is. Of course, there are some specific concerns, but this is much, it's much more broad than that, much more uh, all-encompassing than that. Uh, and that's to our benefit that we have this letter. And again, I think it's due in such a large part because Paul hadn't been there to see him. And he hadn't been able to tell him all this stuff in person. And so as we think about, you know, that, well, Paul has this great desire. God doesn't allow him to go. Why? Well, I, we don't know all the, all the answers, but we, I, I think that one answer is for our benefit. And for the benefit of, of everyone who's come after, who's been able to read Romans to say, well, the way we're going to get Romans is Paul's going to have to really want to write to someone that he can't get to. So I'm going to stop him from going. So he'll understand I want him to write this. What we see is Paul's commitment to the gospel. Paul's commitment that wherever he is, He's preaching the gospel, he's proclaiming the gospel, and, and even when he can't get there, he says, well, fine, I'll just write a letter proclaiming the gospel. I'll write a letter and tell you in writing all the things that I would have told you in person. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting is that, you know, he's writing to, to believers here. He's writing to Christians, Christians whose faith is known all over the world. And yet, what does Paul say he wants to talk to him about? Minor points of doctrinal disagreement? No. He says, I can't wait to preach the gospel to you. I want to tell you about the gospel. And, and what we see there is this, this hugely important thing for us to remember that, that uh, 
Yes, the gospel is, is how we come to faith. Yes, it's how we enter Christianity, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. And in fact, the way that we're going to continue to grow in our faith and mature is by continuing to hear the gospel and continuing to flesh it out and continuing to consider all of the ramifications and the implications for our lives in light of what God has done for us in Christ. And so Paul says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you in Rome. Now, I have no doubt that, you know, as, as Paul's imagining him getting there, he, he imagines that some new people will come to faith. So he's He's certainly thinking about non-Christians who would come into the faith, but he's also thinking about the church there. He's primarily thinking about the church. He says, I can't wait to get there and to talk to you about the gospel. I want you to hear about the gospel. Why does Paul care so much about the gospel? That's next week. How about that for a teaser? Got your tanner, right? All right. As we wrap up this morning... Mentioned three things that we wanted to see. Paul's desire, he wants to get to Rome. His failure, he hasn't yet been able to get there, but he is resolute in his commitment. He he doesn't look uh, at at this, at, at God preventing him from going to Rome. That hasn't led him to a place of sorrow or discouragement. And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean he's never been bummed out about it. That doesn't mean he's never been sorrowful or discouraged about it. I think he probably has. I don't know how you could be sitting in jail and not be discouraged. Now, we know that one time, you know, there in Philippi, he's singing hymns to God at midnight. Maybe Paul never got discouraged. I don't know. That's actually not true. When we preached through Acts, we saw he got discouraged. So I I want to be clear. This doesn't mean that Paul never got discouraged about it. But in this moment, as he's writing to them, he's choosing to exercise his faith and saying, hey, God has another plan. God has something else that he's doing. And I'm rather than kind of sulking and being sorrowful because of my plans being thwarted. I'm going to continue to trust in him. I'm going to be on board with his plans. I'm going to preach the gospel wherever he is. And if I can't get to you in person, I'm going to write some things to you. All right. So we see Paul's commitment to the mission. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I've tried to mention a few points of application here, but I think if I just wanted to summarize uh, in thinking about this, that, that we have an opportunity as the church today to do what Paul was wanting to do that he couldn't do because he wasn't there in person. You know, we have an opportunity today, as I mentioned before, to exercise our spiritual gifts in a way that builds up and encourages the church. We have an opportunity to to be mutually encouraged together uh, as we share about our lives and we share about our faith and we demonstrate and we show this is what God is doing in my life. This is what he's teaching me. This is what's going on in my prayer life. As we share our struggles and even our failures with one another, that we have an opportunity to experience the very thing that Paul was hoping that he was wanting to experience there with the church in Rome. Uh, And so then, uh, just a a couple of takeaways. Number one, uh, let's commit to being present in the lives of one another. Let's commit to being present. Let's, Let's commit to doing what Paul is saying he wants to do that he desires to do, but he says, I I can't because I'm not there. Well, we're here. We're all in the room this morning, okay? We have an opportunity to commit to being present and to being, we we like the word community here. We call our small groups community groups, but but just to be in relationship, okay? People used to call it friendship back in the day, Uh, but just to be in one another's lives and to be friends uh, and to be encouraged. Again, that's God's design. That's what he wants this place to be be. So we have an opportunity to resolve to do that together. Uh, And then uh, I loved this one commentator as he was reflecting on Paul. He he just said this, let prayer be a substitute when you cannot be present. You know, for Paul, he wasn't able to be present in the lives of the church in Rome. And so what did he do instead? Well, he prayed. (laughs) He prayed for them. And he says, I prayed constantly. I prayed unceasingly for you, for your faith, even that he would one day be able to be present with them. And and I think it's a reminder for us that, you know, sometimes we can't be present. Sometimes we are not God. We're not omnipresent. Sometimes there are real barriers and we we can't be in all the places with all the people that we would like to be. Uh, And the amazing thing for us as God's people is that that doesn't mean we're out of the game. It just means we're, we're going to go about it another way. We're going to pray, and we're going to ask 
that God would be present with them when we cannot be. We're going to ask that God's strength would be strong for them uh, when they're weak. And so uh, we have an opportunity, again, to pursue presence with one another the way that Paul was hoping to do, and, and to say, hey, when we can't be present, we can pray. Okay? We can follow Paul's lead and his commitment, his resolve to be committed to God's mission for him regardless of what the circumstances were. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for Romans 1. And uh, thank you so much for Paul and for him writing this. And i got to pray uh, that as, as we have considered these words this morning, as we've considered uh, the rest of Paul's introduction, what he was hoping to accomplish by visiting the church. And I'm going to pray that we would take advantage of the opportunity that we have because we're here, we're in person, we're present. We have what Paul did not have with the church in Rome, an opportunity to be present, an opportunity to mutually encourage one another. God, would we not waste that? Would we not waste it? But would we take advantage of it? Would we pursue it? I've got to pray for those of us who maybe, like Paul, have some dreams, have some desires, have some plans that are unfulfilled, uh, that have not gone the way that we wanted, that have not gone the way we hoped, uh, and we don't know why. I've got to pray um, for those of us who are in that spot that you um, would just be present with us this morning, that we would be able to trust in you and in your sovereignty and your goodness and to know that, that whatever the reason is, even if we never understand it in this life, that we can trust in you and to continue to move forward with whatever it is that you've put in front of us to do. Uh, God, help us to have the faith that we see in the church in Rome, the faith that we see in Paul. May that be true, the faith in our own lives by the power of your spirit at work in us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body that's broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, in this cup is the new covenant, which is my blood shed for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Uh, as we come now to our time of response, we, we come to the Lord's table. And we do that to be reminded uh, of, of, of right where Paul ended there in verse 15, where he said, you know, I want to come so that I can preach the gospel so that you can hear the gospel, uh, so that we can reflect on the power of what God has done. And, and each Sunday when we come to the Lord's table and we receive the elements, that's one of the things that we're doing. In fact, I would say that's the main thing that we're doing is that we're, we're hearing the gospel and we're considering the gospel in a fresh way uh, each Sunday. Uh, if you're here this morning and you have repented of your sin and you've put your faith in Jesus, then we'd invite you to participate with us here in a moment, the, the band's going to play again. We're going to sing a little bit more. Uh, as that happens, you can come forward. Uh, we'll, we have lines on either side here at the table. You can tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, proclaim together with us uh, that our only hope is in Christ. If you're here this morning and you haven't yet come to the place where you put your faith in Christ, that's okay. Uh, we'd ask you not to participate right now. This, this is a family meal. It's only for those who've made that decision to follow Jesus. Uh, instead, I'd ask you to consider what we've talked about this morning, and in particular, uh, what we talked about right at the top, as you think about your own dreams, your own desires, your plans for your life, uh, and to consider wh where is the Lord in that with you? Wh where is it that he might be encouraging you to move in a different direction? Uh, if you have any questions about what it means to be a Christian or to follow Jesus, I'll be available right here in front of the stage after the service. I'd love the chance to Father, we thank you.